The following is a presentation of Project Independence and WCWP. Project Independence is the Aging in Place initiative of the Town of North Hempstead. Welcome to Project Independence and you. Good morning and welcome to Community Talk Radio. This is Project Independence and you on LIU Public Radio. I'm your host, Rebecca Miller, along with co-host Otto Los and of course our radio show producer, Christina Liu, who is also the Director of Senior Citizen Affairs for the Town of North Hempstead's Department of Services for the Aging Project Independence. She also has the longest title of anyone <laughs> I, I, I've ever known. Um, no, you get you it every week now, Matt, so you're doing a great job. <laughs> how are I you have this the morning? shortest title. Um, <laughs> I don't know. You have, you have the longest title. You do, too. No. You have a long title, too, because you're everything. You're no. our ambassador. For, um, well, that's for all right. That's a good title. So, it's, a great so, course, it's great to have you here, our um, Project Independence and You team. And our guest today is very special for many reasons. Right now, she's super special for joining us from the West Coast. So we're recording this show oh. in New York. It's 10 a.m. in the morning, and I believe it's 7. So being that at seven, I'm sure you had to get up even earlier to join us. So yes. our guest is Elaine Frankel and uh, she's Franklin. A Frank Franklin. Frank. I'm sorry, Elaine Franklin, and she is author of Once Upon a Time in Beverly Hills. And everybody's holding up the book, um, and we're just so excited to have you join us today, Elaine. Thank you so much for getting up so early. And um, we've all read about this book and it, it's just, it's just, it's kind of heartwarming in a way. Um, Thank you. I Thank you. Thank so, you. Uh, before we kind of find out about the book and your inspiration for writing it, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, if anybody read the book, I'm Joanna. Oh, okay. I can never be more than three feet away from food. Chocolate sings to me. I harmonize. I, <laughs> you too. It's oh, it, so I. I mean, I'm not completely Joanna, but but, jo um, I've lived here for a long time with my husband and my my family. As it says on the back, I do live in Beverly Hills, and I do slather on sunscreen, and I do avoid strenuous exercise. <laughs> I'll, and if I could take only one thing to a desert island, it would be chocolate dark, bittersweet chocolate. Mm -hmm. And that you know everything about me. <laughs> and that's your story. That's so, my story. Yeah. Well, yes. I'll tell you what, though. How about what did you do before you decided to write a book? Um, I got married very, very young, had my children. And then I decided I wanted to write. And I lived a normal life. But my, when I started to write, the impetus for this was I was at UCLA and I was writing a serious book because that's what you do. And I looked up and the world had gotten grim. <laughs> you may have peeked and noticed it has gotten so grim. And I thought, I don't know, this is not, I need, I need to, not I want to laugh. I need to laugh. I need some humor in my life. And that's Once Upon a Time in Beverly Hills. I just had to go into this wonderful other world where it's sort of the world we used to know maybe 15, 20 years ago, maybe. And it's just, I, I, I just wanted to, I wanted to, I wanted people to laugh because I know I needed to laugh. And so I wanted to hopefully get people to smile and laugh. So uh, that's how long did it take to write the book? Like I'm always curious about the process you know, of writing a book. Longer, it took longer then I hoped it would because in the middle of writing it, my back said, hi, pay attention to me. And I had a very complicated, very complicated back surgery that took a long time to recover from. And um, I don't know about any of you, but I find it difficult to write funny when I'm sobbing in pain. It's just, just maybe it's just me, but it took it was a break of, of, of a couple of years while I tried to get my strength back and I tried to get some of the pain away and I tried to get me back, if that makes sense. Sure. You know, have you well, gotten the pain away out of curiosity? You know, pardon me? 
have you gotten the pain away? We in a couple of weeks we have somebody about pain management on the show. Um, yeah, I'd like to hear it and see it. Um, I do, except that I have a third of my back is is metal. It's just metal, mm. and um, so the only part of my back that works is the upper part because it's all fused. It's I've got titanium rods. I've got a cage holding my spine together. When you talk to that person, ask him how many people he knows that actually have a cage holding their spine together. Mm -hmm. I'm special that way. So, so I, 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 you know, it. You learn to handle pain if it's not too horrible. You know, you are persevering, and I'm so impressed with how you came through all that because that is traumatic. But um, on the other end, you really, you know completed this wonderful, wonderful book. And I know it's getting a lot of buzz on Amazon and Goodreads. So yeah. what I know you started the book before you went through what you were just explaining. Um, and then you came through. So what what's your inspiration? Because I mean, we all here on the East Coast, you know, we we love all the Beverly Hills stories and stars and glamour and and the reality shows. And you know, I'm like sometimes I watch the reality shows Beverly Hills watch. Is They're it not real? Reality. Could it be so is this real? And then, you know, I love that you write this kind of I, I want to say uh, any woman, I think, anywhere can identify with this story. So Thanks. it seems Thanks. so heartwarming. But um, so how did you get, I mean, I like you said, the inspiration is really almost like a, a, about yourself and, and your feelings. So I, 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 I just needed to laugh. I had to laugh. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. And then um, actually, I, it came from, a, I had a lunch with my girlfriend and we were having our usual scintillating conversation. What do you want? I don't know. What do you want? And I don't know. so I find I said, what do you want? And she said, I want to eat wall to wall food and never gain weight. And I started to laugh and I said, wouldn't that be fun? And then, you know, when you get an idea and the hairs stand out, the hairs, went up, and I said, wait, 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 wait. What if you could? Well, what if you could eat wall to wall food, never gain weight? She said, I'd love it. I said, no, you got to think about it. You'd lose your friends. There is no one on this planet who is going to sit with a carrot in one hand and a cup of coffee in the other and watch you eat the entire set, the entire dessert tray. You would lose your friends. And she said, I don't care. <laughs> so I came home, called my daughter, exact same conversation. How would you like it if you, I'd love it? You'd lose your friends, carrot, coffee, I don't care. And at 12 o'clock that night, Joanna woke me up. And I had to run to the other room where the computer is. And I wrote for two hours. And I, Joanna was nice enough to introduce herself to me. And I knew her story and her two friends. I sort of knew what they needed and what they wanted. And that was that was it. Then I just started with it. And, oh, yeah. and, it, it's, it, and it makes me laugh. I'm so grateful that it makes me laugh. So I'm just curious, like you say, that's what started it. When you write a book, like in your case, we're asking you specifically, when you write a book, did you know what the ending was going to be when you started? Or do you kind of build to it? I, I'm not the kind, I've never been the kind, I know there are wonderful writers who write everything on cards and then they just go in, and they, okay, well, chapter one is this card. and cha But I wanted my people to do what they were going to do, if that makes sense. And I just knew about, I knew Joanna, as you know, Joanna, if, if any of you read it, Joanna is um, on a local television show. And they win an award, as a matter of fact. And you can see that she loves food because she's got the award in this hand. That's a chocolate chip cookie that she's hiding behind her back because she has to be around food. And she she's told that she has to lose weight or, or she'll lose her thing on the program. And then the others, I knew that, that Lauren was an illustrator and what she wanted desperately was to put her own loves and ideas on canvas, her ideas, not somebody else's illustrations. And I knew what Nikki, I, I didn't know their names that first night, but I knew that, what she wanted. So 
So um, it just sort of, once I had that initial thing, it just sort of started going. I can't explain it. It just, they started talking and I let them talk. So these are the three main characters who are, are they all their best friends? They're good. They're good friends. And, and, and I really, when I say talk about friends, cause people say, Oh, it's hard to meet people. It's like, you know, when you get older and there's things to, to obviate that, which I'm sure you're working on. But um, when I say friends, it doesn't have to be your significant other or the woman. It can be, it can be your significant other if you're lucky enough. It can be your sister or sister-in-law or your children. If you're, and it can be you. It can be you. You can be your own best friend. And enjoy yourself. So friendship is so important. It is right. so important. We we talk a lot about um, Elaine being mindful, like uh, you know, in any situation, you know, mindful is a big term that could be helpful anywhere. But, you know, it sounds like you're really talking about just taking the time to look around and, you know, be mindful of your friendships and of yourself. And, you know, it really sounds like this book came out of, you know, your heart. Like, well, I'll, I'll, tell, you, I'll tell you something else. I, I wasn't planning on saying this, but my dad, who... <sighs> If my dad ate an apple, you would run to get an apple. If my dad laughed, you would laugh. He didn't hear the joke, but you'd laugh. He had such vitality, such one of you. And he died at 50. I think he forgot to wake up, but he died. And that changed my life. I was 18. And from that moment on, I became so worried about everybody in my life, trying to keep them care close, trying to keep them safe, trying to, you know, I just, and I realized that if someone at 50, which is obscenely young, could die, then anybody could die. So maybe I'm more, I say I love you to my friends when I, we hang up, my dear friends. Mm -hmm. I finish every conversation with my family. I love you. There's never a conversation without I love you at the end because I don't know if I'll ever see them again. I'm assuming I will. I don't know. So friendship and caring it all means so much to me. And that's that. That's where I, I came from. Was that? I wasn't going to plan on it. No, but I agree with you a thousand percent on that. I happen to be an only child, all right? So I grew up... Um, no brothers, no sisters, but luckily in a neighborhood where I could go out in the street and there were all kinds of people around, right? Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, but the result of that has made me a person who will reach out to try to get friends uh, because I wanted friends when I was a kid. And I, get, I had friends. And as an adult, it's the it's same hard. story. Uh, yeah. You reach out to people, to your friends, who may not reach out in reverse, not that they don't want to. I know. Uh, you know, there's a lot of friends that uh, you're the only one who seems to reach out. Yeah, uh, tell me, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but that's all part of it. I mean, and that, that that's what makes friendships. Some people reach out and some don't. That yeah. means, that doesn't mean that the other people don't care. They no, do. As long, as long as the friends, what is important for friendship is when something good happens they are thrilled and happy for you. And when something bad, and in the book, people reach, I, I call it a phone hug. They need a phone hug. They need to talk to someone. And it's like a hug because you know the person cares. If something bad happens, you know you can go to them for your hug. And that's that's just so important to me. I, I you know, some people might be loners, but I think we're, we're people who are not loners, you know, I think we need other people in our lives. So, so. Um, well, your book definitely goes down that path. I read most of it. Uh, <laughs> but then I clipped it like to use a little clip art kind of thing, you know, but uh, the, 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 the characters that you show um, to me, a big thing is uh, like the accepting people, um, for their situation. And yeah. in this book of yours, wait, B 
became a big situation. So maybe well, in, you could go into that a little bit. Yeah, in Hollywood, I'm sure you know, models, actresses, everybody lose weight or you lose your job. I mean, that's just, they all say they're paid for not eating. I've been to some events with actresses and the plates at the end are the same as the plates when they put, first put them down. Hmm. They can't, they, I, I describe the scene, what, what they do, they, they stir the food around, they're talking, <laughs> they're always moving because then their hands aren't on the forks. Um, it's, it's, and I went to a, a dinner after a premiere and there was a little tiny behind a curtain, a little tiny table, maybe a table I could seat four, and it had the desserts. So if you wanted a dessert, you had to do it all by yourself. You had to walk all over there, like a walk of shame to go get it and come back. So nobody touched it. I wanted to go because I wanted to see what it was, but I didn't have the nerve. If nobody else was going to do it, I wasn't going to do it. But they, they, they don't eat. They can't eat. So it's a, it's, it's a, I mean, men too. I'm not just saying women. Mm. And men have to work out and get the the abs going, you know. So one of my favorite movies is I watch it every time it's on, or I'll watch it on a plane if it's on a plane. Is The Devil Wears Prada, and oh. it's so, I mean, telling. It's honest. It's funny. But like how, you know, Emily is not eating because she's going to Paris and, you know, they think that um, Anne Hathaway's character is fat because she's a size four, you know, oh. and they said, and and they said, oh, she's a six. That's like, that's like a 12 or a 14, you know, it's yeah. just. And that's, that's, that's true. That's how they work it. Yeah. That's why they, how they work it. But, but Joanna's got to lose weight. And, and um, would you like to hear about the story? I want to hear. Yeah. So all about the story. And you know what? We're going to take a quick break first. And okay. then when we come back, we're going to hear all about all okay. about Once Upon a Time in Beverly Hills with author Elaine Franklin. You're listening to Project Independence in You, Community Talk Radio and LIU Public Radio. And we'll be right back. Take WCWP with you wherever you go with the WCWP app. Listen live 24-7 to all of our streams, all from one app. Plus, call the studios directly from the app and visit our social media. Download the app through the iOS app store on Apple devices or the Google Play store on Android by searching WCWP Radio. Or visit WCWP.org for links. The WCWP app, available now on iOS and Android devices. Welcome back to Project Independence in You. I'm Rebecca Miller, along with co-host Otto Lowe, and show producer Christina Liu. We're talking about Once Upon a Time in Beverly Hills with the author, Elaine Franklin. And Elaine, right before break, we were just about to get into the story. Um, and it's, it's heartwarming. So uh, we just would like nothing else than to hear about this book. Well, I don't want to give everything away, but... Joanna um, is called in and told she works for um, movies, a studio, television studio, local television in Beverly Hills, and they win an award. And right after they win the award, she's called in and told um, she either loses weight or she loses her job. And since she cannot, she cannot walk away from chocolate or tiramisu or key lime pie or name, name it. She can't, um, she can't lose the weight. So she, she makes a desperate wish and it comes true. And, um, that, let me digress. Do you remember the movie big with Tom Hanks? Of course. Do you remember the movie, uh, first wives club? Some nice person wrote a review and said, if big got together with the first wives club, once upon a time in Beverly Hills would be the baby. <laughs> so that's sort of what it is so she she gets her wish granted and at first it's like champagne blowing through her heart she's so thrilled the weight's just coming off but her family and friends are worried uh the hostess of the show wants her fired getting jealous and her that's major major pardon me said interesting now they now that she they want to fire her now that she's well the hostess wants her fired because she doesn't like competition she liked it when she was big and she has a major motion picture star who is 
a client of hers because she's a decorator. And now that she's thin, he thinks she's now worthy of his very, very special private attention. So all she wants is her life back because it's gone off its axis. And she finds a way. And it's funny. The whole book is funny. It sounds funny. so it sounds so nice. Um, it's there's got so many, to it. so many great quotes that you have about being overweight in Beverly Hills. That's a misdemeanor. Overweight in show business. Ah, that's practically a felony. <laughs> I mean, true. it's so it's so funny um, and, and sad, you know. Um, yeah. But Joanna sounds like a great character. So um, are you are you involved in any other books right now? Are you is there a I'm, sequel I'm, in mind? I can't figure out a sequel to this because because of the ending. Um, but you can, it's very interesting considering what you do. Um, I'm going to write my next book about older women because we seem to get ignored and become invisible. Yes. And, and I don't like that. So I thought, and I remember Mel Brooks, he said, if you're really upset about something, do a comedy about it. Laugh at the problem, laugh at whatever. So that's, that's, that's what I'm thinking of doing. My and next you know in very interesting because we'd say on this show a lot of times that uh, older people feel invisible and you use that word. And in a lot of cases, it's true. They are invisible. It's you become, if you're a woman, you become invisible at either 45 or 50. You just yeah. become invisible. Now, men can be an actor. He can be 95 years old, have one tooth left, and he'll still put them with a 20-year-old. Right, yeah. right. And, you know, Elaine, um, the funny thing about it is the population, the majority of the population now is older. And the older the older population are also consumers and probably yeah. the ones with the most money. And yet there's still this stigma. I think it's a little better, I, but I mean, certainly probably not in Hollywood, but um, you know, recognizing that people don't just become frail when they get older. There's, we still enjoy entertainment, food, travel, and they're really the population that still has probably the money to to spend. So I feel like, you know, it's almost for some reason, we just the older population, we just don't have the voice that we need to say, no. hey, you know, maybe maybe there's another population that not that they should be invisible, but, you know, you should recognize Absolutely. what our capacity is. I think I think ageism is really a big big issue in America. And I think also, it may be, maybe I'm wrong, but when I was younger, I remember people didn't live that long. Do you remember people didn't? Oh, sure. No, no. They they to it was, it was, oh, 64 years old, you know, and now it's completely different. And, and I don't think we know how to handle it. I really no. don't. And we don't because we've never been in that situation before. We talk that, Elaine, we talk about this all the time on the radio show. You know, we've never been in a situation where we have, of course, the baby boomers are all turning 65 um, mm -hmm. and older and people are living a lot longer. So you, we have with our membership with Project Independence, we have people in their 90s and hundreds, some still driving, living in their home, you know, oh. cognitively wonderful, but unfortunately frail, but it doesn't mean that they want to give up their life. Absolutely. But, but like exactly what you were saying, that older population having so many people in their 90s and living 105, six, um, we don't know. We really don't know what, what that means. When I was a kid, I it was very rare that maybe my, a friend or a, there was a grandparent that lived to 90. Today, it's common. Yeah. I can tell you I could tell you right off the bat, I have, I still have friends that have grand, you know, grandparents. Well, I mean, you know, it's getting there, but a um, <laughs> little younger, you know, even my, my mother in her mid 90s, a bit mid 80s. Oh. So she would kill me if she heard that <laughs> one. And they all know my mother. So uh, she's um, younger than me. Delete that part. Delete that. Delete, delete that part. <laughs> Dan, pull that line, please. Um, 
I do believe, so, though, that there's been some positives. <clears throat> like, I go back a little further than, than any of you do. And uh, I recall people really, really being looked upon as old when they hit a certain age. And I think that now, a lot of it has changed based on the person themselves. Oh, yeah. If they don't act old, you know, you, you, I know people who acted old when they were hit 40. Yes. Um, yes. You know, and um, yeah. I think, you know, yeah, you're older. I don't like the word old either, by the way. Older is better than old. I don't even has, say, if you notice in the book and in my life, I don't say that word. I spell it. I say, now that I'm getting O-L-D-E-R, I never <laughs> say that. I don't want any, I, I'm O-L-D-E-R. And getting O-L-D-E-R every day. And that's fine. That's great. But anyway, um, uh, Joanna has the wish um, granted. And her life completely changes. But through it all, her, even though they're worried about her, her friends are connecting with her and, and helping her. It's, 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 as I say, I think it's, it's funny. And it's, it is lovely to have friends who care about you. And um, uh I just, I just love the, I love my ladies. I love them. I, I thank them at, in the acknowledgments. I thank them for letting me spend time with them because they're just fun. You know, there's a little of that in there where, you know, with the antique store and getting her wish uh, that sometimes I guess the message is be careful what you wish for, because it mm -hmm. may not be exactly what you are hoping for. Well, that's, that's exactly. In fact, at the beginning, I say, People say, if only, if only I could get the job with that television station, if only I could meet the one, but I think the most popular, if I could only lose weight, and that's why the new year's resolution, lose weight. Sometimes we get ambitious and we add and get in shape, but every year it's to lose weight because we don't do it. And we think if, if only comes true, There'll be this wonderful, we don't know what it is. It just sort of wafts out into the air, the wish. No idea you could get the job with that person, with that company, and the boss could be, you could find the right person, and he's very much the wrong person, even though it, it, you never know. So if only, it, it, you, you just don't know what you're going to get when, when you get, so she, she does it, she thinks she knows, as I say, champagne is going through her heart because the waist just falling off and it's fun. So, uh, and now she can eat anything she wants without gaining weight, without the fear of it. So, right. but she's, right. she, she, as she says, reality is, is highly overrated because her friend is taking her someplace. Her friend is very organized and she said, we have to do this. We have to face reality. And Joanna looks at her and says, reality, my friend, is highly overrated. And I believe it. And that's why it's on the book. Reality is highly overrated. So. <laughs> the weight thing, it's just so remarkable. Um, and, you know, and it's such a market, too. I, I remember like 15 years ago, maybe 15 years ago, there was a, an interview with, with Oprah. And she was just, you know, being very honest. Uh, obviously, she's probably, you know, one of the biggest kind of stars with this battle back and forth. And it's been so, you know, it's helped people identify with her. And she was saying, you know, talking about her success, um, probably the richest, one of the wealthiest women in show business. I am, I have a network. I have friends. I have homes. I have, I have a family. I've got all this incredible things, money beyond anything I'll ever use, building schools, doing all this spectacular thing. And she said, this morning, I got on the scale and it told me I was going to have a really bad day. And that's, and she's like, all of this stuff, how wonderful she is, all she's done for women and television and, you know, all the, all the things she's done. And it's it was her weight that made her have a bad day. You know, right. it's like now she's on Ozempic. Pardon me for interrupting. Right, now exactly. She's on, now she's on that journey. She's then so right. So, so um, yeah, it's like when you're there. What so what happens now? You know, boom. There's like, is there a party? A ticket tape parade? I'm at my goal weight. Um, you know, yeah, yeah. It's, um, 
You know, so if, if you push that a little, I'm sorry, a little further, like the stigma of weight, I think is a big message oh, in this good. book to me anyhow. And yeah, it, you carry that further and there are so many other stigmas that exist. You know, you, you don't look right or you, you know, you walk funny or whatever. And these are uh, things that people carry with them. Uh, you know, like if you're, if you're overweight, uh, you, you, some people will feel like everybody's looking at you because you're overweight. And, you know, there are so many things that we as people don't accept uh, in other people, uh, you, you know, all kinds of stigmas. And it, it really is wrong. Uh, yeah. You know, a lot of I, things. I chose is, to do the, the weight thing because that's what, what right. around here, that's really a big, big, and it's a big thing to me. I'm short. And so, Two pounds on me is, I don't know, like eight pounds on any, you know, because there's no place for it to go. <laughs> you know what I mean? But um, anyway, uh, it's. I was going to ask you about the characters in the book, the friends. Um, I know you you said that Joanna, Joanne, you identify with her. Do you identify with the friends? Do you have friends like that? Or is it something that you want to see in friends or people that surround you? you know, I, I've been lucky. I have some really good friends. And, and they're, they're sort of a composite of different women I know. Because if I gave a character a name of somebody I know, they started acting like the friend that I know. They started talking. And I, I, I didn't want that. I wanted the character. It's, it's psychological, I know. But they just started. So I, I changed the name so I would have a blank canvas on, on, on how to write that, you know, but I, I, I do have friends. I think we all have friends who that super organize, super, you do this, this is it. okay. This is it. This is it. My aunt was like that. And that's where Lauren is sort of, you know, okay, we'll do this. You got to do this. You got to do it. Da, 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 da. You know, where my characters go, I don't want to, <laughs> you know, you got to do it. And, um, then Nikki is just a, a composite of some women I know. And um, and these are, by the way, these are our women. I know there's a lot of books and they're wonderful with with uh, characters that are 20 and 25. Mine are in their 40s. They're in the middle of their careers, their relationships, their lives. And I mean, they're they're in the middle of their lives. So I, I just wanted to get that in that women at any age, can, can be fulfilling and, and do things and accomplish things. Now, another name in your book is Allison. Yes. What, who, how does she fit into the equation? Allison is the hostess, or she would call it the star of the program, and is not very nice. And uh, she's the one that wants Joanna fired when... Joanna starts to lose the weight. And and I do know of, of somebody who had somebody come on the show and she said, no, she's too pretty. Hmm. So she didn't get hired. Very so Allison friend. couldn't be one of your friends. Allison couldn't be one of anybody's friends. Right. <laughs> she, couldn't. she keeps getting married. She's got her latest husband with her in this. But... There are some people who just are not very nice. They might be very talented, but they're not. I'm sure you've never met anybody like that, but there are people who aren't very nice. Well, you talked earlier about uh, be careful of reality, what you get. You know, you get your dream job, and then you end up working for somebody who's a, not a nice person. So you never know. Will, you want that job. Right. So all of a sudden, the job is not your dream job anymore because you're working for somebody who is not a nice person and makes your life miserable. Yeah. So uh, people come down to being a key ingredient in this stuff. Oh, people are, people are the key ingredient in our lives. Don't you think so? Oh yeah. I mean, really, if something happens good or bad, don't you want someone to know? Don't you want to share the news? with someone or if somebody you know has something happen to them and they reach out to you isn't that a good feeling that they care enough and they know that you're good i mean people are are the 
the big ingredient. Can I just get one thing in real fast? I don't know how much time we have. Well, we're going to go to a break and then we're going to come back okay. and we can, we can finish up on, on the next segment. So, okay. um, and after break, we'll continue talking with Elaine Franklin about Once Upon a Time in Beverly Hills and also talking about whatever we want to talk about. You're listening to Project Independence in You on LIU Public Radio. WCWP is your home for great music and great conversation. You'll find all that and more on WCWP.org. Listen live on the web, check out the lineup, subscribe to podcasts, and stay up to date on the latest station events. Get in touch with us and let us know if you like what you're hearing. And find out how you can support or get involved at the only community public radio station serving Nassau's North Shore. Plus, sign up to get a free bumper sticker. It's all online at WCWP.org. Welcome back to Project Independence in You. I'm your host, Rebecca Miller, along with Otto Lose, co-host, and of course, our radio show producer, Christina Liu. We're talking to Elaine Franklin about Once Upon a Time in Beverly Hills. And before the break, we were just talking about friends and people that maybe shouldn't be your friend. And the one thought that just came to mind that I love this saying, I've always thought about it and remember it. A friend is a gift you give yourself. Yes. And, a, yeah. and and the gift, and it's a gift that has to, I believe, keep on being exchanged. You have to be a friend. But I just wanted to say, um, I'm going to be, if anybody's coming out to LA, uh, April 26th and 27th is Los Angeles Book Fair again. I've been honored to be invited to sign my book. I'll be at the Putnam Smith and I'll be there at 10 to 11, but 10 o'clock, not having to get up before the sun and start a <laughs> coffee drip. But at 10 o'clock this time, from 10 to 11 there, and I'd love to say hi to people if anybody wants to come by and say hi. So I just well, wanted to. So anybody no, that's listening to this radio show, um, it'll also be aired on North Hempstead Television. Um, so there's you know, we could reach out to people, absolutely, if anybody is anybody, in LA. Um, yeah, yeah, and and also I wanted to to say that my book is available, um, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and seven hundred independent bookstores around the country. So if anybody's looking for it, so. see, I wanted to bring up the business part of of being a writer, which is a reality <laughs> of life. I think, uh, if you don't mind talking about that for a few minutes, uh, I my opinion is, and I've seen people diddle with writing. Uh, but never really get anywhere. And then I think about, well, this could be a good hobby, but how do you, if you really want to make money doing it, uh, I have which no is idea. A, yeah, it's not, not a bad motive. <laughs> yeah, no, I, but, but um, if that's what you're writing, if that's the only reason you're writing, I, I, you know, just, just to make money. I don't, I don't know if you write the right kind of book because the book I think has to come out of your soul. This is my opinion that, that the, the characters and the people all have to come somewhere deep inside your soul. And it, it, as far as money, um, you spend a lot. You spend a lot doing things. And but I love every second of it. And I love it when people people leave reviews. Um, I thought my book was for women, 19 to 99. And you go and look at the reviews and there are men which stunned me leaving beautiful reviews. And one man said he, he basically only read um, business books and his wife got it and he thought, I'll take a look and he couldn't put it down. So that was very nice. I was very, very happy. So I'm glad it, it speaks to men too. I didn't think it would because I thought it was for women. But uh, well, as I said, I did read most of the book. I didn't finish it yet. Uh, well, I hope but... you finish and find out if she gets out of trouble. I'm going to plan yeah. on it. Yeah. <laughs> now, what about? Uh, it seems to me that this book could really become a movie. Uh, well, that's what I'm hoping for. Yeah. And the funny thing is, I live here. I've been places. I don't know any producers, directors, or showrunners, and that's who has to get to see the book. And now, especially because they 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 lost eight months with the writer strike. So I and I think it would be a perfect movie. And and there's lots of actresses in their 40s. I think who would you know, like to have a role that it's not, let me give you some coffee, dear. Right. You know. Yeah. 
Well, I'm not in my 40s, but I you know, definitely if you need an actress, I'm here, Christine and I, you know. Uh, <laughs> but um, it sounds like it would be a really nice story. And, you know, I keep what comes to mind is, you know, I always want to, I think there's always a curiosity, Aline, to see yourself the way other people see you. You know, you, it's such a, it's, it's like, and gee, I wonder what they really think of me and not in a negative way, but you know, I wonder how people really perceive you, you know, is obviously with your main character different, you know, than what she thought maybe, you know, like here they are loving this woman and nothing about her weight or, you know, appearance in the real people that loved her was really and you know had was was why they loved her yeah it was really important for me to have a husband who, he's like my husband um loves me no matter what well, right. the, the back surgery um no makeup tears more tears hysterical tears and hugs and love nothing but hugs and love from him for the whole, I mean, I'm talking over a year to recuperate, to try to recuperate. And, you know, I don't know about any of you, but when you don't feel well, and you're not wearing makeup and you're like this, you know, and your husband says, I love you. It's pretty wonderful. It's pretty wonderful. Yeah. But I, I really, I just wanted people, you know, I don't, I reread books. I watch movies again, television shows again, if they, and even though I know the laughs coming, I know it's coming. I still love the time when it comes, when it hits. So I hope people will reread and reread the, the book. I really do. It's 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 just a happy, fun, enjoyable time away from reality. Because I still believe reality is highly overrated. <laughs> I do. I do. Yeah. We're inculcated with negatives from the moment we get up so so i just sat there with my book and no tv and no just some music playing and uh and what's interesting i don't know if anybody else has said it to you sometimes the characters take over hmm. which stunned me because i thought something happens with lauren and i thought well, i know what she wants and i had her say no to something and she stopped talking she actually stopped talking to me. And I'm waiting. I got my fingers. In. So I finally said, okay, I'll let her say yes. And she just kept talking. That was it. So I don't know who's writing the books, but, <laughs> but it was a surprise to me. Yeah. A lot of metaphors in there. Yeah. Well, getting engaged with the characters is why I think some streaming type shows uh, are really good because the characters have some depth. And you get into the people as far as the show goes. And, he, and a couple of these have been friends. A couple of girls and women have been friends since they were girls. And and that kind of long history is kind of special too. And um, But I, I just, without getting, I just really, I, I'm hoping that my next books will be funny, funny, funny too, because I need it. I don't know about you, but I really need some relief and some fun and some laughter. Well, we, we all need it. And there's a wonderful, wonderful message in there in addition to being fun and, you know, which is the draw for a lot of us, you know, Beverly Hills lifestyle. And to kind of say, hey, you know what, they're, they're, they're not all fake. There are people with feelings and there are friendships there. Is this the first book that you ever wrote? No, I wrote, my husband liked spy novels. And I thought, I'm going to write a spy novel because I love him and I'm going to... And I started doing the research and I started sobbing. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't do it. It was just so desperately unhappy that those times and things are, I just can't, I don't want to go there. You know, I want to go, if we have our choice, I want to go to the bright, the light, the happy as much as I can. I mean, talk about my back surgery. I'm so grateful. I wake up every day. Thanking that I, God that I can see, hear, walk, talk, and think. And walking is a big part of that because mm -hmm. my back. 
So I'm I'm just so grateful. And I just want to Johnny Appleseed spread seeds. I want to spread laughter. <laughs> it sounds so corny. And I'm sorry. I just made that up. And I'm really sorry. But I just want to have people laugh, smile and laugh and and enjoy themselves. Unmitigated, just just unmitigated happiness for that length of time, and then maybe come back to it later. But I would love for it to be a streaming show or you know a movie because I like to watch the First Wives Club over and over. Certain scenes are just speaking, you know, or any of those fun movies, which yeah. I, I think we need. I think we need. I do bring- too. I think it's a great message because the fact is. We need to have fun. You have to be able, things are so serious and and stressful in our daily lives, especially in this country. We all work so much and so hard and everything is so And costly. then you go home and you but, turn on the TV. Right. Or the radio. Could you bring Joanna, Nikki, and Lauren to another, to the next level in their lives? You know, when they I get could. older. I couldn't, I, and that was one of my thought processes, but but they've done their, their, they've had their arc. They may have another arc in them, but they've done, you know, I mean, Lauren is an illustrator because she needs to earn money, but her dream is to paint, to put her soul on canvas, her own dreams, her ideas. And, and at the end, she gets to do that. So I don't know what her next goal would be and i i'm thinking of um i'm thinking of women in their 60s and and 50s 60s 70s and i need to have a conversation with someone that will get me the the way that the idea of for this i i it's it's around me but i can't quite firm it up if you, if, if it makes sense so. well uh, uh, lauren is going to be impacted by ai <laughs> uh I just read, I just saw yesterday that AI is writing books and Amazon is selling them. And Jane Friedman, who's, you know, tells me, she, all of a sudden there's three books and she only doesn't have three books there. And it's terrifying what AI is doing with that. But that's yes. a whole other subject. And and um, uh, so that's going to be happening. But, but but as far as writing, actually writing, a person writing it, I, I'm looking forward to writing with with other women. And, and and I see that some other women, I think maybe you do with your groups that you see, of people who, not that they've given up, but they might think life is sort of behind them. And I have, that's why I can talk to you afterwards. I have some suggestions. Um that that I think might be uh, helpful for people uh, to do, yeah. not just if you have time, I can chat with you. Or we could, you know, definitely connect later because one of the things we like to say is you're never too old to start. We've had people start exercising during COVID because we were able to air exercise classes on television. They're not savvy or maybe they don't have a computer, but because That's of- right. You know, there's people, um, you know, starting out, starting new things. And I know Otto talks about this book, or I'm not sure where you heard it from, but instead of saying retirement, maybe think of rewirement, you know, it's it's a whole, all different ways of looking. I mean, personally, I'm turning 60 in a few weeks and, you know, it auto helped me a lot, I have to say, because it was, it was just freaking me out. It's a, it's a it's it's a zero number. It's any it's of the a number. Zero. It the is zero. The zeros are the ones that get to you. You can be fifty seven, okay, fifty eight, but suddenly sixty with that zero. Like that, right. Like what is that? What is it? Really doesn't mean anything. I mean, I, I can't collect social security. I can't do anything different. You're right. It's, it's just. just it's it's what I and you know, I feel like I'm I'm just still my youngest my youngest self. Because you are, because you are. You keep yourself busy, all of you. What's great about about what you do, and what's great, my, my husband has not retired, will not retire. And when you learn new things and deal with new people and deal with new p- problems, and you are actually growing neurons in your brains. They've proven you're 
growing new neurons. That's why they say, go learn a language. If you can't think of anything else to do, go learn a language because that will help you. And he deals with different people. This one's complaining about that, that one's got, and he has to meld them. And each deal is a different set of people and a different set of problems. But you do grow your neuron, neurons and anything that you're doing that's new is helping you grow neurons, which of course is helping your brain keep you very young. So I'm happy to say that I'm 87. All right. And um, looking back in my life, I think, um, first of all, you have to be lucky uh, oh, yes. to maintain your health. And, you know, you can contribute to that. But then there are some things that I will tell anybody you have nothing to say about. And you can get struck with things that are not pleasant. Well, heredity uh, is, is, is heredity. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So, but the, keeping that in mind, that you first of all be thankful for what you have if you don't have an issue. Uh, gratitude is a big one that we talk about, uh, and the other one really is the uh, we use the word retirement and rewirement. I yeah. think that's rewiring your life is almost going on every day. You know, adapting to change. Uh, you know, can I do what I I used to play a lot of baseball? Can I play baseball now? No. Yeah. okay so what can i do now pickleball. Uh, well pickleball yeah i don't have time to be honest about it because i play golf and i bowl and oh, i'm wow. involved i still work uh as a sales coach uh, we had an interesting conversation with tina when she was on about that who you know talked very highly of you uh and uh you know, adapting to change to me is a is a very critical thing. And then identifying some purpose, whatever it is, as small as it is. And anyhow, we got the ghost sign. So yeah, um, I mean, I mean, unfortunately, that's it. And what a wonderful guest! We want to thank you so much, Elaine, oh, frankly, thank for you joining so us today and talking about this wonderful book and hopefully a series and maybe a movie. From your um, mouth, we'll 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 from Beverly Hills. Thank you so much for joining well, us. Thank you all so much. And if if you'd like to chat with me about some ideas I may have, uh, you have my phone number? Feel we free. have your phone number. We're going to call you. We also have a book club. I'm sure we'd love oh. to get this book on the Kindle for our readers. We'll be in touch with you about that. But we do have to run. We want to thank everybody who joined us today and listening, so listening to us you're listening to project independence in you on liu public radio thank you all